drive these step sizes to zero, because otherwise we won't be charged. Okay, that, that's the usual wisdom of stochastic gradient descent versus gradient descent. Okay, questions? All right, so, uh, so this is a, a slightly more detailed explanation of uh, And there's theory behind all of these things. Uh, so what we really want from the gradient estimates is some kind of accuracy with respect to either the current gradient value or the current step that we're doing. So these are examples of two conditions under which convergence of um, a stochastic algorithm has been proven. Moreover, it's been proven with the essentially constant step size. I have to say essentially because it's not really constant, but, but it tends to be kind of constant like. It tends to be uh, large ish, and uh, you have um, uh, good properties and convergence rates that are fast. They essentially match those of exact gradient descent. And then there's stochastic gradient descent, which means that, sorry, I mean, they're all both stochastic, but this is a classical setting uh, where the assumption is only that an expectation you have something approximating the gradient, maybe exactly, maybe not exactly. And you have a bound on the variance, but you really don't necessarily have uh, this. So let's let's think about it for a second. What's the difference? So look here. We have the difference is the variance between the estimate and the true gradient, and it's bounded by some constant plus another constant times uh, the gradient value here. Now. Um, very often in machine learning, this second part is assumed to be zero. So I this to be zero. You just assume that the variance is bound. This is a very bad assumption. It's not satisfied by many functions, including quadratics, so it's been a stupid assumption. But it turns out that you really don't need to need that. You, you would need this assumption. And this assumption is that it just basically says that if I'm uh, if my gradient is zero, then I have a bounded variance, and if my gradient is large, then you know my variance grows proportionally. This is, this is good. Um, nevertheless, when my gradient is small, I don't have a small variance. The variance is there, right? It doesn't uh, There are cases, there are, there are cases there of gradient really settings where if c is zero. If c is zero, then uh, basically I am almost in this case, almost the same. Here, I'm bounding the difference between these two things with some probability. So it's not the same as bounding in an expectation, it's actually weaker. But I also have another small constant. Here, I'm saying that the variance is bounded by a large constant, possibly large constant, times the gradient uh, value, if I see zero. And in both cases, I can prove convergence with uh, fixed step size and uh, you know, path grade. But the fixed step size, well, it's 1 over L here, essentially. I mean, it's all 1 over L because the, the constant's here, but it, but it is really a 1 over L, the variance, and you got to get rid of the variance. If there's a variance here, if this constant is large, then my step size becomes 1 over uh, that times the mean. So essentially, if I have larger variance, I just make small, shorter steps. So there's no magic here, right? This is, you just need to take the shorter steps. If you take shorter steps, you make more of them. So there is a clearly a trade-off, right? What, what kind of uh, do I want to have a good uh, variance, and that will, as we'll see, it will cost me to have a good small variance, or am I allowing myself to have large variance, and then I'll have to make shorter steps, and then I'll have to go Okay. So this is uh, now points for discussion. Raise questions. So, large variance results in small steps. Uh, moreover, in many cases, as you saw, the, the, these constants, these the soft step sizes, even if they're constant, they have to know the variance, they have to know the uh, Lipschitz constant of the gradient. It's kind of hard. And you can kind of have to tune your step size for an individual um, setting. And people have to do that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are methods that automatically choose step size instead of line search. Um, and line search is a very powerful algorithm, but it 
really requires an extra thing. It requires function values, not just the value. So you need to have zero to order oracle for that. You need to decide whether you are. So what does line search do? It basically does not allow you to take steps that increase your function or increase it by too much. So you need to verify what happens with your function and you don't have exact function information, so you have to be very careful with that. Um, and um, uh, basically this kind of thing, these ideas, have been already explored quite a bit, that you want to keep the variance down and that you maybe want to explore step sizes and all that, but it's only being explored in the setting where uh, the standard machine learning setting, as I said. And what I want to argue is that there are many other settings where uh, it's interesting to basically explore them and put them into these frameworks, but for that we somehow need maybe some unified um, notation or unified uh, way of looking at uh, you know, what this setting does. This would be my experiment to work with. Okay. So what else what I want to say is uh, that uh, bias, which people are so kind of worried about, often versus race, is kind of strange because so in machine learning the idea is that you have an unbiased gradient estimate, but nobody cares about the variance; it's just not. And I argue that the variance really matters, and the bias of course matters, but the bias there's nothing you can do about it in principle, and it only matters in the sense where you're converging. So you don't have to really change your algorithm uh, if your gradient estimates are biased. It's just at some point you start kind of circling around. But you'll converge to a neighborhood that depends on the amount of bias you have, and your algorithm can be totally blind by it. It is almost true. It is if you're using line search, it is not quite true about the bias in the objective function values in the zero quarter because there you better you don't have to know exact bias, but it's a good idea to be a bit relaxed about um, the way you're applying line search. So you have to be a bit careful. But you still converge your neighborhood. And again, there's analysis of all the things um, out there. Okay. And so the final kind of pitch for you know what I what I'm going to talk about is that ultimately we want to measure complexity of an algorithm. Right? This is what it's about. And there are many different algorithms and uh, they rely on different types of stochastic oracles. And what has been really done so far, in, in some sense, is that uh, the assumptions, so the, the, the number of iterations was analyzed. Stochastic oracle usually would be used as is, so it's assumed to be costing one unit for the call of stochastic oracle. Uh, and therefore, complexity will be just in terms of these calls of this unit. But, but then different assumptions are made on the oracle. And uh, different oracles are cost differently, or could cost differently. And if you actually start putting in a possibility of using different types of oracles, you need some requirements about what this oracle should be like, what kind of, and analyze what cost to come at, right? and uh, what are the requirements. So this is basically uh, what I want to argue, and I have a particular suggestion of how we could look at oracles, but that's because that's what's useful for me and my work. Other people may argue differently, but nevertheless, I think we should be kind of talking about some more unified framework like oracles that take into account things like costs and materials. Any questions so far? Okay, so here is a suggestion. So they, they, these two things that look the same and they are the same, it's just that they actually may be thought in different oracles, but the way they are formulated is the same. Uh, so basically I want to say that I have a, a particular oracle that is implementable over sets of pairs, M and delta. So M is the bound on the error. Oops, sorry. Uh, so M is how much error I want to tolerate in my approximation. And delta is the probability of failure. So this is, I want it to be true with probability 1 minus delta. And so this oracle may, depending on what kind of oracle I look at, it may be implementable for different pairs of M and delta. 
So for any M positive and delta positive, you can implement this work and you can have it. We'll see examples that you may or you may not. Same thing for first order oracle, given a pair of uh, given sets of pairs of M and delta, I want to be able to implement uh, uh, this oracle. And given particular M and delta pair, this oracle will have a cost. Right? So, uh, first stochastic piece. Uh, this is hippogriff. It's a baby, or nice looking <laughs> No Harry Potter stories. Uh, hippogriff is, a, is an interesting animal. It can be very useful, and very friendly, and very powerful. Uh, but only on approach with care and respect. So this is um, uh, empirical risk movie, expected risk movie. <laughs> so what is expected risk minimization? Uh, so we have uh, a loss function uh, of a model parameterized by x measured on the data sample p. And ultimately what I want to do is to optimize uh, the expected loss of my uh, model, right, on the population. Okay. Uh, so typically it's assumed that this loss is nice and smooth somehow and uh, I can compute its gradient with respect to x and the usual uh, oracles are computed by just picking a batch of data points, usually fixed size, picking it randomly. So this b is random, that's what they use psi for, but now it's all b because it's indicated in the batch. Um, and just simply averaging out the value of the loss and the value of the gradients over the batch. Right? Um, and so, if we simply use temperature inequality, which is like the weakest thing we can use, uh, applying it to this assumption. So, this is an assumption on the loss uh, approximation, which may or may not hold, and we will argue that it doesn't hold. Um, but if you have this assumption, right, so this is um, uh, the variance that does not go to zero, and this is the piece that where it grows the gradient. So with, you know, having both of these pieces, uh, and if we want to achieve accuracy m with probability 1 minus delta, we simply just look by temperature inequality, and it tells us that our uh, batch size has to be this. Right? So this is the cost. And um, under many conditions, you don't have to use Chebyshev, you can use Bernstein, in which case, dependence on delta is going to be nicer than the other logs. And um, for function values, you can choose this analogously, and actually, for function values, there's a lot of theory in terms of learning uh, T's, so you can apply learning values. And um, they will give you exactly this kind of work. <clears throat> it was exactly this kind of condition. So, classical learning guarantees say that this, the difference between the function phi and its stochastic estimate is bounded by some number of the number. Um, so, this is you know, not the first one to come up with this kind of oracle set. Okay. However, uh, not always the case, as I said. Uh, specifically, the, the, the most interesting thing, actually, is to optimize empirical risk. I called it empirical risk before, but really it was empirical loss. The difference between empirical loss and empirical risk is risk is a very particular measure. It just says, I want to optimize the probability of, or like, say, minimize the probability of making an error, making the wrong prediction, right? I, my model should... Uh, the probability of uh, making your own prediction should be minimized. This is ultimately what we want. This is how we, those of us who submit papers to things like NURPS, this is always what we have to report. Uh, it's the, you know, the, the, kind of the measure of the approximate probability of making it. But, um, and, 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 and interestingly, that function is smooth in many cases. And, um, think of when it is smooth, but it's, yeah, it's probability that the model makes an error, so the nice distribution is smooth. But its finite approximation, the one that you can compute on a batch, looks exactly like the step function, 
because basically it's uh, the sum of the beginning one. And so what happens here is that basically no matter what batch you pick, uh, the gradient of this thing is completely useless. The function value is not actually. The function value approximates the true function value as well. But so the gradient is completely useless. Right? So this becomes a different kind of piece. And uh, I don't want to deal with that. Uh, unless you're a really powerful <laughs> Okay, so what's the alternative? Um, the alternative is um, finite differences, for example. Uh, and finite differences is, is, is a very boring thing. Everybody knows finite differences. We kind of learn them already in college, and then we forget them, uh, about them unless we really have to use them for work uh, and for our communication. But, um, it's actually fairly powerful, and I'll argue that it's uh, it should be revisited for for some of its effect. So, what is finite differences? So, I have here uh, four finite difference and central finite difference, and basically you just only measure functions. So you don't know anything about the gradients. Functions are random, uh, and you go in you know directions of coordinates. And uh, you kind of measure the difference between the two functions, values, right? And you divide it by the step size. And then you kind of uh, do this for every coordinate. So EI is at least identity vectors. And so this basically gives you the approximation of the rate. This applied map, you see this all the time. So, central finite differences is better, but uh, I will mostly focus on. on uh, um, forward finding differences and precisely so the central finding differences don't necessarily that much better in our case because we will have noise. So the situation is like this. So if the noise between my, so this is essentially my, uh, you know, how noisy my approximation. So this is the, the, the zero order oracle here sitting, right? And this is my M. So with some probability, hopefully high enough, uh, I can bound. So maybe I should have to end here, but um, I can bound this difference. And if I can bound this difference, then I can also bound <clears throat> the difference between the gradient approximation and the true gradient. And this would work. Again, you have seen it probably in standard error analysis. Uh, so what do we notice here? That uh, if sigma gets smaller, so the step that gets smaller, if I don't have noise, if I don't have this term, then uh, I can drive sigma to zero and get as good approximation as I want in the gradient, so this will go to zero. But on the other hand, if this term is not zero, I cannot drive sigma to zero because this term will explode. So I have to find some kind of a balance, and sigma actually goes to sigma to square root of that. So it tells me how good approximation I can possibly hope for for this. Here it's going to be uh, cubic root of that square. So that means that I have a um, first order oracle derived from a zero order oracle that takes exactly n plus 1 or 2n plus n plus difference. This first order oracle falls, so that's my cost. So I know exactly the cost, at least in terms of the first order oracle. Uh, but I cannot drive n to zero. n is the bounded from zero. So I can describe many things about this work. The cost exactly. I didn't describe the dependence of probability because that will depend on the probability of this thing folding, and so they're interconnected. So whatever probability of satisfying this condition for zero photo work will impact the probability of actually having this error in the first photo work. But I can describe all of these things. And um, you know, it's an owl because it's it's very reliable. Um, but, you know, not only very powerful in the sense that it's funny. So here um, is an interesting kind of interesting experiment uh, that I did. Um, so just kind of thinking about costs uh, and variances of oracles 
so here what I drew is a, is a sigmoid function. Uh, and it's a sigmoid for various, so this is a sigmoid function. This is gradient here. And the different values of A. So A grows, the sigmoid starts approximating the step function. So basically, the fact that we're dealing with a bad step function uh, and, and things are, uh, you know, the, the gradients are useless, as I said, it actually carries over if we start smoothing out the step function, but we don't smooth it out too much. And if we start smooth it out too much, then we have something else, a different function. Right? No longer the function that we maybe want to talk about. So essentially, yeah, there is, there is this kind of this continuum when we, um, you know, approximate the, the step function that we have this crazy behaving gradient. Okay, so now I take this function and I actually smooth it out by taking expectations. So my two phi is actually kind of a smoother version of this. And here I'm plotting it for a nice value of a equal uh, 1. So what I did is, uh, I, so this is my phi, and what I'm plotting is a stochastic approximation. So it's approximation using 100 samples. And I think it uh, and this is the function itself, and this is its gradient. Uh, and the blue is the computation of the gradient exactly by sample average the actual gradients of the sigmoid. And the black is doing finite differences. And here, finite difference is a little bit noisier. Let's see. But if I increase A, uh, then the situation changes. <laughs> and uh, the blue is the, the, the noise in the gradient, oh, sorry, I'm still averaging 100 gradients. Uh, and the function itself is not quite noisy, but it's not bad. Uh, but the gradient is kind of all over this. So the variance is large. And this is the gradient approximation using finite differences. And uh, so now you can see kind of that the finite differences actually can be, since it has smaller variance, Remember back, I'm telling you, variance means you can make larger steps, more variance, larger steps, larger steps, more efficient algorithms. So there is maybe a reason to use finite differences. Okay, so why not use it all the time, right? Uh, why don't we use finite well, Why don't we use finite differences? Uh, well, it, it is expensive. Uh, we need to compute the first order oracle n times. So again, one can argue, depending on the situation, uh, first order oracles, uh, sorry, zero order oracles may be actually more efficient, so expensive. But n is the dimension, right? n is the number of variables. So if I'm doing it for a neural network, uh, n is very large, and so this will get very expensive, and I don't want to do that. Right? Uh, but still, one, one should have, ask the question. I mean, yes, it's cheaper to compute the gradient itself, maybe, without finding differences, but uh, if it has a very large variance, essentially my algorithm will be less efficient, so there's a trade off that I should just call it. Um, but I will ask a different question, so can we do better? And there's been this very, very popular class of methods, and everybody just goes for them because they seemingly so good, and I'm again going to argue that once you look at the variance, so it's kind of again a shit of this here, because it again gives me a stochastic gradient, and it may work well, but it's a, it's a less friendly uh, Okay, so what's the difference? It's again finding differences, but this time it's randomized finding differences. And uh, as I said, it's been like over the last maybe five years or so, it's somehow became very popular. Uh, and people just stick it in whenever there's zero code optimization, this is what very often very often do. So what happens is that it's, it's, it's the same exact thing as the binary differences, except for the, the directions are not coordinate directions, they're just randomly generated directions. So you generate the random direction, but Zero uh, mean. So, like, for example, uh, uniform on a sphere or a Gaussian. Uh, and then you just compute, essentially, this is as a directional derivative in a random 
and then you can average out the bundle down. And you can, you can pick any number. So n is big n, then you just one. So it means that with just two functions out, you can actually have some kind of gradient function. Okay. And so that's why it's so appealing. Seemingly, I can just compute two function values, I have a gradient approximation, uh, and uh, I don't need to actually count. And I can apply this same thing, for example, to the step function. Um, without having any other useful gradient information. So I can use that. So if you analyze the variance uh, of the appropriate first order oracle, again, you can do centralized and uh, forward find a different version. What you get is the following. So again, assuming that the first order oracle has some kind of a bound error, uh, your uh, probability of this difference being bounded by this number is 1 over 1 minus delta, and this number is, so there is this term, that's the bias, you cannot get rid of it. It's the same bias essentially as just time differences. So that bias is there, so we cannot make arbitrarily accurate first order oracle. But then there's an extra term that time difference goes down. And that term scales together with the size of the gradient. And basically has a little n here, which is the dimension, and the big n here. Okay. I would ignore the delta because again, if you depend on what you're using, you can use Bernstein if you're using the so you depend on the delta constant. But this is important. So to make this small, we need this big n to be of the same order as this one. Right? Uh, which means that basically the cost of this oracle is still going to be proportional to this little m if we want m to be somehow comparable to the bias, not much like this. Okay? So, so here's again a situation where I have a first order oracle that is cheaper than my finite or finite differences. I can, you know, in one function evaluation I can uh, get a gradient approximation. But because of the variance, I'm going to make shorter steps. And so essentially, I'm not going to gain anything in the end. And I wouldn't be able to apply certain things that I don't talk about, but if you have accurate gradients, you can apply uh, other improvements like, such as LBFGS and whatever these kind of things that make practical optimization very practical. So, yeah. Okay, I have to throw this one in, even though, um, well, this is a useful universe. It's my favorite. It has to be a very nice uh, piece. So this is something that comes out of theory of the optimization I used to work on. And I still think it's a very powerful tool, but it hasn't been actually used in stochastic optimization that much. I mean, it has been used some, but not like, there's not that full of theory for that yet. Uh, and so what's the difference, basically? It's, um, again, I can write it in a similar form to Finite differences, this time my directions are not random, they are arbitrary, but then uh, the direction I'm stepping in and this direction here are different. This actually, this U is the columns of this. I take all the directions in which I'm measuring my function, put them in a matrix, invert that matrix, this will be this direction. So there are other ways to write it, but all it is is linear interpolation. So I have n plus 1 uh, function values are just approximate uh, and again, I can have uh, bounds on what happens with the gradient approximation. Again, based on function values, so it's kind of random. So this is also random. Uh, and essentially, I can have uh, this bound. And this bound is exactly the same as the finite differences, except for I have this. Uh, the norm of the universe here. So if my directions are badly positioned, if you don't spend the space well enough, if the matrix is close to singular, then uh, the, the error is large. So I have to make sure that this is not so large. What's the advantage of this over finding difference? So finding difference is basically a beautiful identity. So it's just, you know, the same case. But So why would I have something that is not identical? Because uh, then I can reuse all function values, right? I, as, as I measure more functions, I can reuse all function values because 
I don't have to have this rigid structure that I only measure my function values from the current point in, you know, in any directions. So I can maybe what, measure one function at a time and then kind of keep on updating my polynomial uh, calculation. Um, and uh, that is sometimes very, very effective. Um, so far, there's no clear theory that we can gain anything theoretically by it. In practice, we definitely can, but not in huge dimensions so far. In huge dimensions, it's very hard to maintain it this um, in the R. Okay, so here is a comparison of just very simple, uh, on a simple function of this. So I showed you the bounds of the variances, but this was the upper bound, so is it really that bad in practice? And yes, it is. The point is that uh, the, uh, so this is finding a difference approximation in two dimensions. This is the uh, interpolation. I pick like, three points here, it's a two dimensional problem. I approximate this very nice function here by a linear function. And these two are very good approximations. This is essentially close to a given approximation. And the Gaussian smoothing, sorry, Gaussian smoothing is the one running by the uh, But basically, randomized by the difference with Gaussian directions, this gives you pretty lousy approximations. Uh, on the sphere, it, it's random, so it looks a little bit better, but it's not really, it's just, Better. And if you throw enough points at it, then it starts getting better. So as you can see, with a sufficient number of samples, it will produce what you want. It will produce a good approximation, but then it's, it's possible. Uh, uh, and this is the same thing more generally. Construct this kind of city. So there was a function in two dimensions, and you can expand it to multiple dimensions and try out different things. And and uh, this is basically the number, with the same number of samples, the error that you get with the uh, final difference is much, much smaller than any other interpolation than with the okay. All right, so breath, and this is our last piece. This is something that I studied recently, and I understand very little about that. Um, and this is reinforcement learning, and some of you may understand a lot more, but this is reinforcement learning of a very particular model. So if you don't know what reinforcement learning is exactly, just think of it as this setting. I kind of find this setting very appealing, because the very many experiments in reinforcement learning, and, and the big theme of reinforcement learning is all about playing games. And as cool as it is, you know, it's not really that important to play games. It's important to make decisions, right, in complex processes. Um, so uh, I kind of find this uh, setting appealing. I actually didn't put a reference yet. Um, but this is from some paper of my, one of my colleagues at, at uh, Cornell. Uh, they are studying it from the point of view of cubic theory. And you know, there's a lot of um, you know, uh, policy making in some sense based on uh, cubic theory. But it, it, it's only recently started people started looking at it from the point of view of reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is also a very, very large area, and I'm looking specifically at policy optimization. So what is policy optimization? So I'll try to explain it based on the set. So we have a, um, uh, uh, basically, an emergency room, server, sorry, an emergency room, and we have two queues. There's triage and there's treat. So people come into emergency room at some for some reason, and they join the triage queue. Uh, they get eventually processed by a nurse at some rate, and then we collect a reward for that, uh, and then they join the treatment queue. There's some case we can maybe some people will leave but uh, and go home, but in general they they, uh, they go to the treatment queue, and then in the treatment queue they also get processed by a nurse. Eventually, they you know, people, people, but they out of the emergency. Okay, and we collect very well. So we generally want to process people, uh, and so we have a finite bank of nurses. And when they're all busy, so of course if they're not all busy, then every time somebody comes in, it's uh, they, they get 
they took that one if I ask them whatever. But but the, the idea is that they will be seen. And the next time the nurse becomes available, that nurse should be sent either to triage or to treatment. So where do they take the next patient from? Presumably they can do both jobs. Uh, and so that's the policy, right? You have to decide. Uh, and the policy depends, on, of course, on, on the state of the system. So what's the state of the system? We call it very simply, it's the number of people in the system. Okay. There might be other monitors there, but we just like, okay, how many people are in HQ? And so depending on how many people are in HQ, we want to have a function that tells us what to do. And so this function that we are looking at, uh, so these days it's popular to model this function as some kind of a typical that. So given the state, we have a complicated typical that. And it spits out the probability of taking different actions. Uh, so in our case, it's not a typical that, it's just a sigmoid because we're trying to understand it better. Uh, so we have a sigmoid here, and uh, sigmoid basically depends on. Um, uh, so the, the, this is the number of people in the first queue, this is the number of people in the second queue, and uh, actually this probably should be minus, but it doesn't matter. Um, so I'm, opti optimizing the, I'm optimizing the reward function. My policy depends on x1 and x2. So what it means is this function is between 0 and 1, so when it's close to 1, that gives me a high probability of prioritizing uh, triage and when close to zero, it's um, it gives me a high probability of prioritizing. Okay, so it gives me all at once. So now, how do I measure reward? I have to simulate. So I start my queuing process, and every time there is an event that somebody arrives into some queue, I have to make a decision. So rather, every time there's a nurse free, I have to make a decision. So I have to simulate all the events, people arriving to do this process, move. But every time a nurse becomes free, I have to simulate the event. So there's a simulation. It's a black box. It's a black box function that sits on top of, uh, and moreover, it's a, some kind of expectation. So, uh, so I basically I simulate the process from time 0 to time t. Uh, I look at all the states and actions that I encounter. I collect my rewards. and. Uh, what I want to do, I want to, I, I want to uh, optimize this expectation okay. over all possible, what they call rollouts, or all, all possible paths. Uh, but I can't compute that, so I'm going to approximate it by a finite approximation. And so, this is what is very interesting about the setting is that unlike the purely black box optimization, where you don't know anything, you just can compute the approximate function of that. Here are the open simulation. Here I have um, basically uh, the, the function that I have, you can see more clear on the next slide, but I don't know. Uh, so inside of this function, so this is my approximation, right? inside of this function, I have this function pi that I know exactly, it's the sigmoid, I know exactly what it looks like. So I have this black box function of another function, so it's a composite function, of another function that I know. So the function of parameters is this policy, but the function of the reward depends on the policy somehow, and I don't know how. So I can simulate that, but I can actually take the gradients of the policy. And that's what policy gradients do. They have this some kind of very complicated um, way, and uh, you know, it takes a while if you haven't seen or understand how they work. Uh, the policy gradients. But, but there is a kind of by now very well established way, and there is quite a lot of work going about optimizing using policy gradients. And what policy gradients are is this, this complicated structure. So, this is the first order oracle, and it's a fantastic first order oracle. Uh, that is, I said, like, as I said, it's kind of hard to understand. It consists of two parts. Here is a sum of the gradients of the log of pi. So, this is the function we know, and we can. Uh, compute its gradient exactly and what it looks like. And this is the function that we just um, simulate, right? Like some of the rewards. And uh, so we know this, and, and we can kind of maybe see that we have a sigmoid here, and 
you already see that sigmoid is sometimes not, you know, not very stable. So this is very complicated and very hard to deal with function. So what kind of fantastic piece to accept this? So okay, I don't want to do it. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah. So you can uh, use the, uh, use these gradients, or you can define the differences, or something like, like that, right? Because after all, I said, okay, we have a we have a first order work. But the first order work is uh, this function. Um, now, unlike all these other methods, it's much harder to estimate variance. I'm still working on that. Uh, but it, in principle, we should be able to do that. Numerically, for sure, maybe um, you know, understanding the function better and seeing where the variance comes from. But we can estimate the variance of this, and we can estimate uh, the variance of the gradients. And then the variance of this is actually much smaller than the variance of the gradients. And that's evident from basically doing the uh, uh, computing first order oracles two different ways again. One is from finding differences, the other is from policy gradients. And here is the standard deviation for policy gradients and for finding differences. And this is on a log scale. So you can see there's a big difference in the sum of the differences. Anyway, so this is Sorry? X1 and X2. Oh. <laughs> I have to make this compliant with my talk, but the, the, the plots came from my students. Yes, X1 and X2. So it's just to plot it, because if you plot it in two dimension, it gets very messy and hard to see, so I have to plot this fix one at zero and just bury the other. Okay, well, so basically, this is it. Uh, my conclusions are that um, variance of stochastic particles affect the performance. We kind of know that, but I think we can generalize the conditions and the interactions between variance and the algorithmic performance in sort of more uh, systematic way. Uh, and then we can consider different oracles, and I haven't even talked about all possible oracles on the has, you know, in these cases. And, and then decide whether the cost of reducing the variance is worth it in terms of the price of pay. On the other hand, bias uh, that you kind of pretend that doesn't exist or, you know, try to avoid uh, is not actually that big a deal, I mean, it's not very large. And the there or it's not. Um, and, uh, but, but, we, but the point is, like, you know, when we're talking about, for example, um, unbiased estimates with high variance and slightly biased estimates with low variance, we may want to prefer the slightly biased estimates with low variance. Um, and, um, yeah, and then basically we do need to, I think, have some kind of uniform form approach to how we treat stochastic oracles. Uh, just as we do in our standard. So here are a couple of papers that this is based on. It's also based on some prior work. And, uh, thank you. I have a question. Um, so. Activation functions aren't always smooth, but we still, there's a chance that you could, a coordinate could be right at that non-smooth point, but we treat the function as a whole as if it's smooth, and like as it has a gradient. Can we treat it like it's analytic and take the derivative with a, a complex step measurement? Yeah, so, so we're just, we're just telling Jim about this. This is uh, something that I, I got really excited about very recently, but then it gets complicated. So, so okay. So, rel u function, one layer network, continuous distribution is continuous. So that that's just that. I mean, an expectation. Okay. It's not continuous for any fine sample, but it's continuous in expectation. It's very easy to show. 
And then whatever we do with the gradients is correct because we basically, um, so we, when it's zero, we assume it's zero, right? When it's flat, when it's like this, it's, you know, we assume it's this. If it's on the kink, we still assume it's zero and it's okay. So you are doing the correct thing. And so this is exactly um, one of the first things I said is like, the assumption is that the sample approximation function, the DF, is differentiable. That's not true. Uh, uh, but, but, but that's fine in some sense because your gradient still might be a decent approximation of, of the gradient. So the gradient, that's for one um, uh, layer. Now, what happens in multiple layers, it gets complicated because um, basically where, so even on one, one layer, uh, it's true that it's smooth everywhere except for where the weights are all zero. Because if the weights are all zero, no matter what distribution of data you have, you perturb the weights a little bit, you'll have a kink. Right? It, 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 it's it's going to be true for the, and you can plot it in this. Now, if you have multiple layers, this idea that W cannot be zero gets more complicated. So it's like the weights cannot be zero going into the neuron that is, I, I, I forgot, I have a kind of like a formulation, but it's a bit odd. And so I cannot say that it's generally something that doesn't happen in neural methods during optimization, but it makes me believe that indeed what we're doing is fine because the expected value, expected function is actually nice most of the time. And, and then of course, I mean, is it really an expectation is nice? Does it mean that it's approximation is nice? It, 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 it varies. But yeah, this non-smoothness of optimization functions is, is uh, Probably not I guess then the question is if, if it, in most cases, I mean, except when you have all zero weights coming in, it turns out to be smooth and you can use these smooth methods, can we do the same thing with analyticity and say, hey, we can take a, a first order oracle using a complex step? Like, uh, you take, if, if a function is analytic, you take, you evaluate that function just off the real number line, then the complex part of the evaluation is, oh. is you know, the derivative of the, the real derivative of the real function along there. But, I mean, since these functions aren't analytic, but might they be good enough in the same way that they're good and they're smooth enough okay. for smooth well, methods? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how many pieces that. <laughs> on the real numbers. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Any other uh, questions? Do, do you think that there's any possibility of constructing a, an adapt? You talked about the, the importance of variance as opposed to bias, and that, that bias can lead you to converge to a larger neighborhood than you might want. Um, is there any possibility, do you think, for creating an adaptive method that will sort of choose its oracle to have higher, lower variance at the start and then for, for yeah. lower bias? Yeah, definitely. And so, so I, yeah, I, I try to work on methods basically where the requirements on the oracle are pertinent to the exact pattern situation. So if you currently you're in a state where you're far away from optimality, you really don't need to be very accurate. Can have a large bias, and you can also have a, um, a large variance, and you don't have to pay as much. Once you're converging closer and closer, right, you want to pay more attention. And and there's a way to, I mean, for some algorithms, there's a way to explicitly see how much that should be. Hmm. Um, now, for example, the interesting thing is with finding differences. As I said, the choice of that step size is very important. If you choose it too small. The noise dominates. If you choose it too large, then the, the, you, know, you just have a larger bias. So you want to choose it just right, because maybe you can do something with the noise or not, but if the noise is a compromise affair, then you, you have to choose it just right. Um, doing that adaptively is, is kind of something I want to figure out. It, it, it's, you know, people, yeah. in practice, it's very easy. In practice, you just like, Measure function value six times average child gets standard deviation boom. <laughs> it works. It works beautifully. But um, but yeah, how to do that up in the interior. Mm -hmm.
you get point of the bias of the way you get integrated to the amount of the decays. So as long as you start uh, incorporating either momentum and, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth, it becomes out. Yes. So I guess my point is this is put out in using Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it's, it's a good point. I haven't uh, used that comment on other people in that point of view. Well, okay. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, so my, my kind of experience in that is, is uh, from, yeah, I know that Nesterf method, for example, loses all the power once you have there that is not, uh, the gradient that is not really possible. Yeah. No, you're right. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> so. <laughs> yes, okay, fine. I mean, I, I'm not saying it's not necessary. I, I'm not saying it's just not a big deal. I mean, me not being as big a deal as variance in some cases, look at the trade-off. 